You're listening to an Ono Media Podcast. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Into the Dark Podcast with Peyton Moreland. I'm your host, and I'm so happy you are here. If you are watching this video on YouTube, can you please right now give it a thumbs up and then leave a comment below turn on notifications, do all the things. It's a great way to support the show and it's as easy as one little click. So please help me out. And if you are listening on podcast audio, hi, I'm so happy you are here. If you could leave me a review, that would be great. I'm just happy that you're here and I hope you're ready to go into the dark with me. Now, as always, before we get into the meat of the episode, I have to start with my 10 seconds. And again, if you listen to this podcast and you don't listen to my original podcast, Murder With My Husband, this is something that we spun off of that show. So if you're confused, that's probably why. My 10 seconds for this episode is that I am attempting to do a little tea, whoa, a little detox from TikTok this week. And it's just so crazy. And I'm not saying that to be like, oh, braggy, braggy, I'm detoxing. I actually want to talk about something. It's that Whenever I try to limit my time on an app, but I leave the app on my phone or I try to detox from something or I just want to be conscious about my use of social media, it is crazy how often my fingers just naturally go there and click it anyways. It is such a habit, like an addiction, social media addiction. It is hard for me to not click things. I have attempted numerous times this year to not do screen time the second I wake up to get out of bed, literally just plant my feet on the floor before I touch my phone. And I have failed every single time. Social media addiction is so real. And I just find it so interesting. And it shocks me. It shocks me to my core every single time that I attempt to do one of these things to realize how big of a role it plays in my everyday life. And I just, I am fascinated by the psychology behind that. How this fake online world is such a reality in my life. And I don't know if you can relate to that or understand even what I'm saying about your fingers just like subconsciously going there. Leave a comment, let me know. It's just been, it's been crazy. All right, with that being said, let's jump into the episode. And I did wanna give a little warning. This episode includes discussions of murder. So please listen with care. Now there's something people say anytime a gruesome crime happens in a small town. And it's that sort of thing doesn't happen here. And of course, that sort of thing can literally happen anywhere. There's no such thing as a community that's totally free of murder. But Tallahassee in the 1960s really did feel like it might be the exception to that rule. And that might sound surprising if you're thinking of what Florida's state capital is like today. But in the 1960s, Tallahassee was a fairly small city with a population of about 40,000 people. It was growing rapidly and all these chain restaurants were popping up across town. New people were moving to the community and the whole vibe was actually changing pretty rapidly into the Florida we know today. But most of the long-term residents still lived like they were part of a rural community. The sort of place where, as they say, violent crime wasn't supposed to happen. People never locked their doors at night. They'd wake up in the morning and chat with a neighbor before grabbing a newspaper off their front step. Children played outside after dark with no adult supervision and nobody thought it was necessary. Everything felt quaint and warm. And I bet if you asked Florida people in the 60s, they'd have no idea that Florida would become such a big part of the true crime genre in 2024. But let's back up to when grisly crimes started to happen here. So on the night of Saturday, October 22nd, 1966, when Florida State had a big football game, everybody turned out to cheer on the home team. Well, not everyone. Two sisters, Norma, who sometimes went by Jenny, and Judy Sims both accepted babysitting jobs for the evening. So the families they worked for could go see the game, and the two girls could make some pocket change. So Jenny and Judy were part of a warm, loving family of five. The girls got along well with their neighbors. They spent a lot of their afternoons playing outside. There was a wooded area behind their house and it was the perfect place for games of make-believe. Their father, Robert, was very respected with a cutting edge job where he worked with computers. They all were regulars at the church and their mother, Helen, also worked there. Plus, she was a wonderful pianist who sometimes played beautiful music on her lunch break. 
The oldest girl of the family was 17 year old Jenny, and she was looking forward to graduating high school soon. And then her 16 year old sister, Judy, wouldn't be too far behind. And then the youngest girl who isn't babysitting on this night was Joy. She was only 12, so too young to pick up a babysitting shift. So only the oldest two girls went out to babysit and Joy stayed home with her parents for a quiet Saturday night in. So as far as Jenny was concerned, the night started off feeling normal. She went to her babysitting job and everything went great. Afterward, the family took her back home to her house at 641 Muriel Court. It was 11 p.m. when they pulled up. Jenny had actually beat her sister, Judy, back. Remember, they were on separate babysitting gigs. So she pushed open the front door, never imagining the horrible scene that she'd find inside. On her way to her bedroom, Jenny noticed that her parents' door was cracked open. She didn't think anything of it, but she decided to poke her head in and just say hi. Instead, she pushed the door open a little further, and that's when she found her family. Well, her parents and her youngest sister. And it was clear they'd been viciously attacked while the other two sisters were babysitting. Her father was sitting in a chair, tied up with several neckties. They were wrapped around his hands and ankles, plus one was over his eyes, kind of like a blindfold. He was wearing his pants and an undershirt, but no shoes, like someone had interrupted him while he was getting undressed for bed. And there was a bullet hole in his head and blood pooling around the chair. But somehow he was still alive. And so was Jenny's mother, Helen. But she was in very bad shape. Helen was also bound, but with a pair of pantyhose. And she'd been shot twice in the head too. Like Robert, she was bleeding heavily when their daughter peeked her head in to say goodnight. Blood also pooled around her on the floor. And again, it seemed that someone might have interrupted her right as she was about to turn in for the evening. She was fully dressed other than her feet, which were bare. But little 12-year-old Joy was already dead from the two gunshots to her head, one of which went right above her ear. Plus, the shooter had also hit her in the leg. Her attacker had also stabbed her six to seven times and had pulled her pants and underwear down to her ankles. Now, I can't even imagine what oldest daughter Jenny thought when she opened the door and saw this horrific scene. But it's clear she wasn't sure what she was supposed to do. Like I mentioned before, Tallahassee was a very small town at that point, and 911 as a service wasn't invented yet. The very first 911 call wouldn't be placed until a little over a year later, so we were literally almost there in 1968. There was no central number that Jenny could call to reach the police and ambulances and everyone else she literally needed to talk to. Her parents were barely holding on. So instead, she grabbed a phone and she called a neighbor. Maybe she hoped that if an adult was involved, they could take charge and sort everything out. But the neighbors didn't pick up. So next, Jenny flipped through a phone book and picked the first entry that seemed like it might be relevant. And that was a local funeral home. Again, her parents were still alive, but maybe Jenny figured a mortician would know how to then reach the police. When someone answered, all Jenny could say was, something terrible has happened, please come. The couple who owned the mortuary rushed over as soon as they were done talking to Jenny. They didn't know what they were going to find, so they were totally unprepared for what they saw in the Sims bedroom. The moment they walked in on Robert, Helen, and Joy, the morticians called an ambulance. And somewhere along the way, someone also went to get Judy from her babysitting job. Nobody wanted her to just come home and stumble onto the crime scene the way Jenny had. And sadly, in the midst of all this shuffle, from Jenny calling the funeral home to the ambulance actually getting there, the first responders were losing valuable minutes. I don't know if Robert could have been saved with quicker treatment, but I do know he was beyond help by the time the ambulance got to the family home. He was still breathing, but it was clear he wouldn't survive the trip back to the hospital. There was no point in transporting him. One of the first responders did run to the kitchen to grab a knife though. He wanted to cut the bindings on Helen and Robert, let them at least feel comfortable in their final moments. And when the man was in the kitchen, he had an eerie thought. Nobody had gone through this house to make sure it was empty. The murderer could still be lurking somewhere. 
I have to imagine he clung to that knife's handle a little tighter when he went back to the bedroom. And the good news is the killer wasn't around. Now, nobody stopped the ambulance drivers from getting the mother, Helen, to the hospital. She spent nine days receiving emergency medical treatment using a respirator because she couldn't breathe on her own. The whole time she was in the hospital, she was unconscious. If she ever woke up, she maybe could tell police what had happened, who had attacked and why. But so long as she remained in a coma, nobody could question her. And that said, the odds of her waking up didn't look very good. One of the bullets had gone through her brain and was still lodged in her head. Helen stayed in the hospital for a little more than a week, and then she eventually succumbed to her injuries. The last victim of the attack was dead. When Helen passed away, the local papers declared that the triple homicide was the worst crime in Tallahassee history. Remember, it had felt like a safe small town up until that point. And now, the Sims family murders clearly left the community shaken. Nobody could understand who would want to hurt such a kind, friendly family. When Helen, Robert, and Joy had their funeral, practically the entire town showed up. It was held at the largest church in town, and there still almost wasn't enough room. Many people had loved Helen and Robert, and Joy's death was almost too sad to bear. She was only 12, and now her oldest two sisters were orphans. After the memorial ended, the two surviving children, Jenny and Judy, both left Tallahassee for good. From that point on, they lived with their aunt in Alabama. And in the timeline of this case, even though the Sims girls were gone, all of the victims had now died, the police were dedicated to getting justice for this family. Several officers swore they wouldn't stop looking for answers until the case was solved. Unfortunately, pretty much from day one, they were stumped. They did manage to determine something of a timeline. The police figured the Simses were attacked very shortly before Jenny came home at 11 p.m. As in, if she'd gotten back just a few minutes earlier, she may have stumbled onto the attack, been killed too. Joy's body was still warm when investigators arrived on the scene. And of course, Robert and Helen were still alive when Jenny walked in on them. The police could also tell that the murders had been incredibly efficient. The family was killed in the bedroom and the sheets and blankets on the bed weren't even rumpled. There was a cup of coffee sitting on a table. It hadn't been tipped over or disturbed at all. Whoever killed the Simses was so quick, none of their victims even had a chance to fight back. Robert didn't even get up out of the chair he was sitting in. Beyond that, the detectives didn't know a whole lot about how the killings went down. It was almost impossible to determine a motive. Nothing of value had been stolen from the house. There was cash sitting out and the attackers hadn't touched it. There also weren't any signs of forced entry. Now, that latter detail isn't that shocking because like I mentioned before, nobody in Tallahassee was really locking their doors. And the Sims family was no exception. Someone could have just let themselves in pretty easily. Based on the autopsy results, the detectives were confident that none of the Simses had been sexually assaulted, not even Joy. So it was unclear why the killer took off her underwear and pants or why she was the only victim who was stabbed and shot. Some police officers did tell the papers that they weren't ready to rule out a sexual motive, though but they just couldn't prove that's what the killers were after. Now, on top of all of that, the Simses weren't known to have any enemies. They were all upstanding, hardworking people. They had jobs at respectable companies. Robert worked for the Department of Education and Helen had been the secretary at a local church. That was actually until recently. She'd actually resigned a handful of days before the murders. And the police, okay, in this investigation, they did find that timing interesting especially once they started digging deeper into the culture at her former workplace, and that was the First Baptist Church of Tallahassee. Now, as it turned out, the minister there was a man named C.A. Roberts. He was well-respected, and apparently the sermons he gave were amazing. From the way people talked, it sounded like he was also incredibly charismatic. All he had to do was ask someone for a favor, and that person would fall over themselves trying to grant it for him but he also had a dark secret. According to the documentary, 641 Muriel Court, 
Reverend Roberts was sleeping with multiple married women. Once the news of Helen's murder hit the airwaves, many of those women actually started calling the police. They all wanted to be on the record that they didn't do it. Now, if you're confused, it's because Helen worked very closely with the Reverend and the Reverend was having all of these secret relationships. So these women were like, maybe police are thinking that she found out and was gonna come forward and tell and now they think that I killed her to try to keep my secret quiet. So the women tell police, sure, they wanted the affair to stay a secret, but they weren't willing to kill Helen over it. Of course, all of these denials were in fact kind of suspicious to police, especially because they started rolling in before the detectives even knew all of the details about the minister's many affairs. So these women literally outed themselves. It seemed like everybody believed that his sexual relationships might be worth killing over. And after all, like I said, Helen worked very closely with Reverend Roberts. She had to know how he spent his time all day. It was possible that she learned about his questionable sexual ethics, which would have been especially controversial given his position in the church. Maybe that was why she quit. She may have morally objected to his behavior. And if Roberts believed she was going to start talking about his affairs, that she had found out and was now gonna go tell people, there was a pretty strong motive for even him to want to silence her. So instead of bringing in the women who initially introduced this information, the police actually questioned the good preacher. They wanted to know if he killed Helen to keep her quiet or even if he might have been sleeping with her too. But Roberts had the perfect alibi. The night of the murders, he was at the Florida State University football game, the same game that pretty much everyone else was at. Not only was he a fan, but he was also a chaplain for the team. So there was video recordings showing him on the field with the players for almost every minute of gameplay. He couldn't prove where he was during halftime though, but that break wasn't anywhere close to long enough for him to drive to the Sims' house, commit the murders, and then get back for the start of the third quarter. So there was just no way he could have done it. So the investigators turned their attention to other possible suspects, like 16-year-old Tommy Fulgham, he lived right down the street from the Sims's house, so just two blocks away. And according to the documentary, 641 Muriel Court, he was a person of interest right off the bat in these murders. Almost immediately after the murders, the police went house to house to see if the neighbors had heard anything. But each time they went to Tommy's place, he wasn't home. Now, if that had happened once or twice, it might've been a coincidence. However, it seemed to detectives that Tommy was missing every single time they tried to drop by. Maybe like he was actively avoiding the investigators. Now that was suspicious, but obviously not enough to arrest him. After all, it was just as easy to believe Tommy didn't want to talk because he was a scared teenager, but he came to look a lot more guilty the more police looked into him. So fast forward more than a decade. In 1978, now Tommy is 29 years old and he lived in Atlanta. The case up until this point had been cold. So apparently Tommy came to believe that he was possessed by the devil at this point. Tommy was also afraid that Satan was going to take over the world and there was only one way to stop the devil. Tommy had to murder his girlfriend. So that's exactly what he did. In his apartment, he killed his girlfriend and then chopped up her body. He put her liver and possibly some other organs in jars. Again, this was all something that he thought he had to do to save the world according to him. He clearly wasn't thinking straight, but besides the fact that this kid was clearly capable of taking a life, there was nothing definitive connecting him to the Sims family murder. So basically the family murders happen, the police get nowhere. And then 10 years later, someone who lived right down the road, who was always avoiding police, went on to kill his girlfriend. So this is kind of what brings him to the forefront of the case. So now they ask Tommy, you know, what was what was he doing that night? And he gives a pretty solid alibi. He was at a party the night Helen, Robert, and Joy were killed. The police checked his fingerprints anyway, and they didn't match any of the prints that they'd found in the Sims house, meaning the investigators had no choice but to dismiss him as a suspect. There was also a man who reportedly confessed to the crime to his wife right after their wedding day. That's according to the same documentary. His name was Robert Howells and his wife was named Peggy, but she didn't go to public about the supposed confession until after their marriage was already falling apart. 
and they were caught up in this bitter, nasty divorce, which did mean the investigators had to take her claim with a grain of salt. I mean, at this point, she could have just been lying to embarrass her soon-to-be ex-husband or try to get him in trouble. I mean, after all, Robert didn't have any real motive and he passed a polygraph. Plus, Peggy didn't have any proof, just this story about how she heard a confession all those years ago. So again, the police had to rule out Robert Howells as a suspect. Now, I could go on and on describing all of these different people of interest. The possibilities really are endless. And after the murders, rumors were flying. Nobody knew who they could trust, so mostly nobody trusted anyone. And that meant there were a ton of false leads and a healthy side of misinformation. The police even took a confession from one man who claimed he had committed the murders himself. But later, the investigators learned the man was in a mental hospital when Robert, Helen, and Joyce Sims had died. So that confession was a no-go. The detectives actually questioned more than 6,000 witnesses in this case, hoping at least one of them would know something useful. And I hate to tell you this, but nothing has ever come of it because the Sims family murders are still unsolved today. And typically when we have an unsolved case, I feel like we have a thread or two to go on, but there's literally nothing. Some people think the killer could have been identified by now if the police had done a better job. When the family was first discovered after the attack, the sheriff's department did a poor job of securing the crime scene. They just didn't know how to handle a murderer. Some officers even brewed a pot of coffee in the Sims' kitchen. It didn't even occur to them that they should be preserving every piece of potential evidence. And the bad police work didn't end with the original 1966 investigation. In 2016, an assistant state attorney was fired because his employers believed he was planning to write a tell-all book about the Sims murders. Supposedly, he was using some confidential information, which he had access to through his job as a source. The assistant state attorney, Jeremy Mutz, denied all of those allegations. He insisted that he never even thought about publishing anything about the Simses. That said, he did already have some true crime credits under his belt. He'd published books on some other cases using a pen name, but here's where things get weird. After he was fired, Mutz sent a document to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. The information in his memo was heavily redacted before it was released to the public. So I don't know exactly what he said beyond the broad strokes, but apparently, Mutz believed he knew who committed the Sims family murders. He also claimed that he had information that would exonerate some other possible suspects and make it clear who really did it, which does make it sound like he had access to information that the rest of law enforcement didn't have. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to send it over after he was fired. Whether he was hanging on to that tip for a book deal or for some other reason, who can say? It's all possible that the whole memo was a hoax and he didn't actually know anything special about the homicides. Interestingly though, Mutz said that the suspect, the man he believed to be the real killer, was going to appear in a documentary that was supposed to be released later that year. The documentary he mentioned was titled 641 Muriel Court. It was a student film and I referenced it multiple times. Now I know you might hear that it's a student film and assume this was some amateur production. But the story behind the movie is kind of fascinating in its own right. So basically, a trio of grad students were supposed to make a documentary for one of their classes, and they decided to profile the Sims family murders. It's unsolved, it's this major case. And they ended up connecting with a historian who was considered an expert on the case. Now that historian actually believed he'd solved the murders. He just didn't have the authority to arrest anyone himself. So he agreed to meet with the students and share the information he had. So the students are like, oh, we have a great lead here. And this included thousands of pages of police documents and case notes. He also had hours of raw footage of interrogations. It's kind of like a modern day podcast in a way, a podcast that does a deep dive on a case. Um, There was also people of interest who spoke to detectives and the details from those questioning sessions had never been released to the public at least not until 641 Muriel Court hit the theaters. Now, like I said, the former assistant state attorney, Jeremy Mutz, said his top suspect was going to be interviewed in that documentary. And the filmmakers only actually interviewed one suspect. So this is when the public is like, wait, we have a name? So his name 
was Vernon Fox, and he was a teenager at the time of the homicides. So back in 1966, Vernon was dating a woman named Mary Charles LaJoy, who went by Charlie. They'd been friends since they were very little, but they began dating when they were both in their teens. Eventually they actually got married and then divorced, but that was all after the Sims family murders. So in the 1960s, Charlie and Vernon lived together in a house that was very close to the Sims' home. Apparently, somewhere along the way, Vernon became interested in Joy Sims. This was the 12-year-old little girl. At least once, she actually caught Vernon peeping in her window. This was just a few days before the murders, and it may have been part of a pattern. Apparently, for months before then, other people in the neighborhood had called the police on a number of occasions. They said they thought someone was looking in their windows. But it's hard to say for sure if it was Vernon because nobody ever saw who did it. So the documentary said that when it came to the night when Helen, Robert, and Joy were killed, Charlie and Vernon didn't have a consistent alibi. In different interrogations, they each said different things. At one point, they claimed they were at a drive-in movie that evening, but neither could agree on whether they stayed for the entire thing or if they left early. Another time, Vernon actually said his alibi was that he drove to the woods with Charlie so they could have sex. However, when the police asked Charlie about that, she insisted she and Vernon weren't actually sexually active at the time. So now at one point, a few years after the murders, Charlie approached a sheriff and said she wanted to talk about the Sims homicides. So she was involved way, way back then. This is way before the documentary comes out. Then she went into an interrogation with him that lasted for hours. And at one point she said she was inside the Sims's house the night of the killings. But then she walked that statement back. She said she couldn't remember, which was odd. You'd think you'd recall something like that. Later on in that same interrogation, she asked some loaded questions like this. If she were to confess, what would happen to her? Would she definitely go to prison or could she negotiate something nicer? Maybe she could go to a nice mental health institution if she could convince prosecutors that she needed treatment. As soon as the sheriff said she'd definitely end up behind bars, Charlie became a lot less talkative. Now, while her behavior in the interrogation room was suspicious, it didn't count as hard evidence. That sheriff later told a local historian that he thought Charlie and Vernon did do it. He just didn't have enough to arrest them. Suspicions and a weird interrogation weren't enough to hold up in court. The sheriff also suggested that homicides were sexually motivated, even though none of the bodies in this case had been touched in that way. The historian he talked to was the same man who shared all the archival information with the documentary crew, meaning several people connected to the film have suggested that they think Charlie and Vernon are guilty. That would be the sheriff, the former assistant state attorney, and maybe even the documentary makers. And the footage of Charlie being questioned, which is in the documentary 641 Muriel Drive, is pretty compelling. But again, the film came out in 2016, that was eight years ago, and still no one has been arrested since then, which could mean the police are still trying to gather enough evidence, or it might mean that this is a dead end. For all we know, Vernon and Charlie were already ruled out as suspects, with information the police didn't bother to disclose to the public. After all, there's a lot of speculation here and not much in the way of hard facts. Now, before I close things out, I do want to touch on one more facet of this story, the way it didn't just change the course of the Sims' lives. It changed Tallahassee as a town. In the blink of an eye, it went from a community where people believed violent crime just didn't happen to a frightening place where everyone was terrified to become the next victim. Right after the murders, there was a huge run of guns and deadbolts. Everyone was buying locks and weapons to protect themselves. So many people demanded new streetlights be installed on their block that the city actually had to place a special order to fulfill all of the requests. And the murders happened in late October and a lot of parents were too scared to take their kids trick-or-treating when Halloween came around. Others only let their children stay out until sundown. Door-to-door -door salesmen even stopped making their rounds. Nobody knew who they could trust, if anyone. And now obviously this kind of high level vigilance couldn't last forever. Eventually everything did go back to normal, but it was a new kind of normal. The safe feeling small town was gone. Today, Tallahassee is a major metropolis. 
There are hundreds of thousands of residents and everything that comes with a huge population. There are great restaurants, clubs, shopping, and there's crime. There's no turning back the clock. Tallahassee will never be the community it once was, or at least that people thought it once was. Because if the Sims family murders proved anything, it was that these kinds of perfect small towns don't actually exist anywhere, except in our imaginations. Now, I don't like to do cases where I leave you hanging, but also unsolved cases are really important to draw attention to. How is three members of a family shot and stabbed in their house, all of them killed, and it's never solved? Okay, you guys, that is it for this episode, and I will see you next week as we dive further into the dark together. I hope you have a great day. Goodbye. Goodbye.